the door. It will come as no surprise to learn that during the Jurassic period, bats were much, much bigger than they are now. Many years ago, when Wells House was a bustling estate, with stagecoaches coming and going morning, noon and night, and candlelight brightened the windows of this great house, an oil lamp swung from side to side as they were carried from house to stable and back. The Doyne family, respected owners, would leave Ireland and head to the south of France, the Côte d'Azur, for a few weeks to shorten the winter. Every year they would leave on the occasion of the new moon which arose during the month of October and return at the beginning of December. Shorten the winter, they certainly did, and why not? They could afford to. And the months leading up to Christmas can be so gloomy and unsettled. You will already have guessed that there is more to this than shortening the winter. Those of you who have half an eye for the strange, the incredible and the macabre will already be intrigued with the fact that the Doyne's time of leaving was the new moon rising in October. Hmm, you may think interesting. The new moon, the moon which, waxing or waning, will be high in the October sky on the last day, the 31st of the month. And those of you who have been slow to engage so far will surely note that the last day of October, the 31st, is the eve of All Saints Day, All Hallows Day, which falls on the first day of November. And the truly curious among you will wonder why I speak of the eve of All Hallows Day, when every mortal worth her or his salt, from the ancient to the most juvenile, knows all too well that I speak of Halloween. The door, you may wonder, what of it? Which door and why? You may also wonder why I attach such significance to the fact that the Doines avoided Wells House every year over the period of Halloween. And what of the bats, as big as... It was the year 1820, and winter was drawing on with great haste. Much stormy, icy weather had swirled around the towers and turrets of the old house, and though fires were lit and thick gansies and furs were broken out of the winter wardrobes, the household were all a shiver upstairs amid high ceilings and old and drafty, ill-fitting windows. Down below, in the servants' quarters and the kitchens, all was snug with the low ceilings and stoves and open fireplaces. Rosy-cheeked servants down below and blue-nosed and shivering gentry up above. Did you just hear a horse whinnying? There. Who stamping impatiently on the stable yard cobbles? No matter. It was nothing, just just noises. It was the end of October, but still too early to be battening the windows and lining the doors and windows with furs and heavy curtaining, and so an architect was summoned. The meeting was brief, and the architect left with only one thought in his mind. How was he to carry out his orders and change this drafty old house into something with the envy of all the land? The footman summoned the stable lad who ran off around the corner into the dark and in no time returned, oil lamp in one hand and the reins of the architect's horse in the other. There was a flash of lightning followed instantly by a cacophonic outburst of thunder. The horse reared up and as the stable boy grappled with the reins his lamp fell to the ground, glass shattered and flame extinguished. The horse struck the stable boy in the chest once twice, thrice, with its flailing hooves, and the boy fell to the ground, ribs shattered, as the horse galloped off into the dark. All this in barely a second, while the footman stood at the top of the steps with no time to react bar with a choked and stifled cry. The architect had stood back, but immediately ran to the aid of the stable boy, and as he leaned over to lift him up in his arms, a lightning bolt fizzled straight down from the thundercloud, barely inches above the chimney stacks on the house and instantly transformed the architect and stable boy into a raging incandescent 
ball of fire. The family rushed from the drawing room to the main door and servants from below swarmed around from both ends of the house just as a second thunderbolt tore through the roof of the west wing and erupted in an inferno on all three floors. By this time, stable hands and gardeners and labourers from the farm had appeared and immediately dispersed in search of buckets and blankets. But in the moments it took for them to return to fight the fires, the sky had filled with huge, black, screeching creatures, evil and bent on destroying all they could see, and as the servants fled screaming, one unfortunate was grasped by the neck, plucked up at speed, and by the time this slimy, leathery manifestation had reached what remained of the ridge of the house, it had bitten off the head of the unfortunate and swallowed her in one hideous gulp. The family fled back into the house, door ajar. Pandemonium fit for the raging fires of hell ensued as the west wing turned white hot and the air was stenched with the foul odours of the swooping and ghastly aerial monstrosities. Most of the servants had fled across the pitch black fields, but some still loyal to the notions of good sense and the benefits of preservation were fighting off the dipping and diving paleontological manifestations of all that terrifies in the darkest of nightmares. While others formed a human chain, passing buckets hand to hand from the stable well to the base of Hell's Furnace and then back for replenishment. A labourer from the farm slipped as he tried to fend off one of the macabre horrors with his sprung but it bettered him, knocked him down, paused, head arched back for an instant before driving teeth, snout and jaws clean through the poor lad, tossing him in the air as he swooped upwards and catching and swallowing him with open jaw in one deft manoeuvre. The footman, meanwhile, had cowered, arms and hands over his head, crouched in the corner of the front step, and upon hearing the scream uttered and cut off abruptly by the labourer, as he lost his life and being, and recognising the voice as that of his only son, half stood up and scuttled through the main door, slamming it behind him. Immediately, sounding like the whole of the universe whistling out through a narrow orifice, the marauding beasts from hell, squealing and snorting, spitting and dribbling, slobbering and screaming, spiralled into the thunderous cloud lying over the great house of Wells, and as it filled with this mass of stinking, seething, squirming flesh, the cloud receded upwards into the oblivion whence it had appeared, revealing a full moon shining down on this scene of utter destruction. The next day, for the first time, the Doines left for the Côte d'Azur, leaving one instruction behind that the estate manager was to commission an architect to demolish what was left of the house and rebuild, but to leave the main door untouched. They never spent another Halloween in Wells' house. The footman, who had closed the front door and saved the night, was never seen again, at least not in mortal form. A prominent architect, Danny Robertson, was eventually appointed and a few years later the newly constructed house, the one we now cherish and celebrate, was once more occupied by the Doyne family. It is said to this day that if on the night of Halloween a front door is left ajar, a wrath of damnation may be visited upon the owners of that unfortunate household. And if that cursed visitor looks like a footman from the olden times, <laughs>